Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. We are moving towards the end of Revelation. I can't believe it's going so fast. We are in chapter 20, and we just have a few more chapters left. But we're learning, we're growing. I'm being challenged. It's, it's truly given me a, a mindset just as I live life every day. You know, as I just engage people, look at people, I am mindful of what God's showing me and what he's teaching me, what Revelation needs us to see, and I pray that that's the same for you as well. We are in Revelation chapter 20. We are now at the end of the trip of the Millennial Kingdom. And so we see this last piece that needs to take place. We see really the reality, the danger of depravity. You ask the question, what happens in the Millennial Kingdom? We've spent the last two weeks looking at that. Why did God, why does God give us this Millennial Kingdom? There's a lot of really good answers to that. One of the significant answers is found in this last event that takes place. I think one of the one of the main purposes of the Millennial Kingdom, um, among many, Israel being uh, very central to all of that, though, is is simply the reality of the depravity of man, the sin's impact on all of us. And I want us to see this and to understand this as we as we uh, conclude really our time here at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. We see here in chapter twenty, just a reminder: this is this is Satan's last chapter in the book of the Bible, really. He's been bound for a thousand years so that he will not deceive the nations any longer. Now he's released. And it says here that he must be released. There is, a, there is a part of God's plan that must take place here at the very end. Satan's work in it is, is necessary. What Satan's work will reveal in humanity is necessary. And so we see that here. Three elements in the passage that we're in today. We're in chapter 20. We're in verses 7 through 10 today and we're looking really here at the at the final battle that satan has number one the first thing that we see in this passage is that satan is released he must be released he is released why why must that take place what's going on here well he's released so that he can and will deceive the world that's really important to see and verse seven and eight when the thousand years are ended satan will be released from his prison and he will come out to do what to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth. Satan's coming out. He's, his purpose is to deceive the world. Four corners is a euphemism. doesn't mean the earth is flat. It's the whole world. That's what we see here. Chapter 12, verse 9, we're reminded of that. When Satan was thrown down the second time, that great day, a dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and the Satan. Here's why. He is the deceiver of the whole world. That's his description. That's, that's who he is. Of all the descriptions that fit Satan, this is probably the, the one that rises to the very top. He is the deceiver of the whole world. One last time, he will come out, be released, be allowed to deceive. Why? I believe to reveal again and with finality the depravity of man, the sinfulness of man. It is, it is the condition of our heart. We see that in Jeremiah. A heart is sick, it is wicked, it is deceitful. That is my heart, that is your heart. Anyone that you love and engage in, anyone that we see, that's the condition of our heart. Sin has marred and corrupted our hearts. Depravity, it is natural to man, it is the natural man. The natural man does not accept the things of God, of the Spirit of God. The things of God's Word, His values, His ways, His destiny, His path for us, it doesn't make sense to our natural heart. We, we, we do not accept it. We do not embrace it. Because of sin, we naturally have a distaste for that. It is the root of all sin. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. The depravity of man. We are dead in sin. We, we don't have the inability to respond to the life of Christ, to the truth of Christ, to who he is because of the depraved nature that is true in us. It mars all of our choices. Every choice that we make is impacted by the reality that we're sinners. That's the reality. People, relationships, conflicts, uh, choices that take us down the wrong path, all of those things reflect the reality of the depravity of sin, that nature among us. Romans 8, the mind, this mind, this depraved mind, is set on the flesh. It's hostile to God. It does not. Submit to God's law. Law, In fact, it cannot do that. It can submit to the letter of the law, but not to the heart of the law. 
the, the, the law will never be brought into and received by the heart of a depraved man. Sin keeps us from embracing God's Word. You know, the miracle is what Christ has done and does. That's the good news. Don't forget that as we're walking through this. But we're highlighting, we're seeing, God is showing us that what we see at the end of the tribulation is also still very real today. I need to look at my heart and understand that the, the battles that I face are because this is true. Depravity is many things that we see in the scripture. Uh, depravity is a love for sin. You know what, at, at its heart, at its core, that's what this is all about. You hate the good and you love the evil. Depravity causes me to love the wrong things. Depravity causes man to love sin. The, the, the battle is, the problem is this, we love sin. We love sin, that's the problem, that's the battle. Even in a perfect environment, depravity is still going to love sin. Uh, that's its nature. That's what depravity is. It's it's not that we're as bad as we possibly could be. doesn't mean that we do all of the wicked that we possibly think or have access to. But it's that we love sin. We love the sin that we hide. We love the sin that, we're, that we have been involved in. We love sin. We love how we can harness it, use it to our advantage. That's the problem. That's the depraved nature. Satan is going to reveal that depravity once again here at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. Our culture can't solve it. doesn't matter how moral our, cult our culture is. In our sinful nature, we will still love sin. We love, You know, the thing is, we just love, I'm speaking of me too, sometimes, and when we are not following after Christ, we love holding on to an attitude that's wrong. We love holding on to a thought about someone that's not correct. We love holding on to lustful thoughts. We love holding on to, to a disposition. We love holding on to goals that aren't the Lord's for our life, to his, that aren't His will. Sin causes us to love the things that are hurtful to us. It's, it's Christ. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Word of God that transforms us. That's the good news. I'm going to keep mentioning that because that's so important. I don't want you to lose that as we're talking about the depravity of sin. Here we have, it's, you know, go back clear to the Genesis, the Garden of Eden. You have a perfect environment. You have two people. Both chose to sin. And they did it, they did it from, uh, from innocence. There was perfection. There had never been sin in that moment in the garden. They were created sinless, but with the ability to choose. And they, and they made a choice, even though they were innocent before that. They made a choice to sin. Think about, think about what man is capable of. Think about what you are capable of. Think about what I am capable of because I am depraved and so are you. That sin nature is still within me. Christ has changed me. He has transformed me. If you're in Christ, you have experienced that same victory, that same power, but you and I are still vulnerable because of this nature that is in us until one day the Lord takes it from us completely. Depravity is a distaste for what is good. You love evil more than good. That's the reality. Lying more than speaking what is right. We just we love things that are evil. It's, it's hard to admit that. It's hard to be honest that we maybe might even like things that are evil, not God's heart, not God's desire. But you know what? It's true. Depravity is an instigator. It instigates strife. It brings strife. Whoever loves transgression loves strife. That depraved nature. It brings conflict between, between us and other people. It brings conflict into, into communities. It brings conflict and strife because, because we transgress, we cross the line of God's law, we do it our way and not God's way. Depravity is, is a love for personal freedom. Remember, depravity is a love for sin. Sin is expressed in, in all these ways. It is just a revealing of the reality of depravity. Thus says the Lord concerning His people. My people, the people here, as, he, as Jeremiah is challenging God's people, they love to wander. They love to wander. And so, and so what's the result of that? They don't restrain their feet. They don't restrain their hands, their choices. They, there's no restraint. There's no self-control. They do whatever they want. They live for themselves. They follow their own heart. They are their own judge, jury. They are, they, their opinion is the highest. When, when we follow our depraved nature, we follow our heart. We follow, we are true to our heart. Not God's, not the Lord's, not His Word. We follow our own heart. That's what's happening here in Jeremiah. 
Depravity is reflected in just this reality. We love this world. We love the things in it. That's the thing. We love this world. We love everything in it. We put more effort, more time, more priority, more emphasis on, on living in this world and acquiring things in this world and, and having a, uh, a safety net and a comfort zone and, a, and all these things. We put more effort, more time in that than we do in loving God. That's that depraved nature. We get our eyes off of Christ. We get our eyes off of eternity. We get our eyes off of how Christ would choose to use us in this life. And we live for ourselves. Depravity. We love this world more than we love Christ. 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul writes, Demas, who is in love with this present world, he deserted me. How many people desert a relationship with Christ? How many people have deserted churches because, because they love the world more than they love Christ? How many, how many believers in name have deserted faithfulness and holiness? And walking in a way that's right with God because they love the world, because we love the world more than we love Christ. This impacted Paul's ministry to have a fellow worker leave the ministry because they love the world more than they love the ministry, more than they love Christ. Depravity is a hatred ultimately of God's truth. People love darkness rather than light. That light is the truth of God's word. Depravity doesn't want to be around the truth of God's word. Depravity doesn't want to be exposed. Depravity doesn't want others to know it. Depravity is proud of what they do. You know, sin, it's a terrible thing. That, the sin nature in us is a terrible thing. You, you and I, we just need to be honest about it. You need to look into your own heart, look into your own experience, look into God's Word upon your life and say, you know what, that's exactly where I'm at. God, help me. Help me. Help me to overcome. And that's exactly what God will do. God, help me to be victorious. God, help me to love you more than these things. God, give me the transformative love and power of your word. Depravity is, is, is the reality that we're bound by our, our desire to be gratified. We are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We want to feel good. We want experiences that feed us. Uh, we want memories. We want all these things. We, we want to feel good all the time. Whatever it takes, many times our coping mechanisms or our attempts to try to feel good in the midst of of life's challenges, life's adversities, trials, ups and downs, tribulations, challenges that overwhelm us that we can't handle, and so we and so we gratify ourselves in the moment. It becomes addictions, it becomes habits, it becomes destructive, all those things. We love pleasure. God's given us the ability to love pleasure, by the way. He's, in, he's given us the ability to love things and to enjoy things, but the pleasures of this world are not to be the goal of our life. And we need to remember that. Depravity gets us focused on things that are in this world that take, that take the freedoms of God and turn them into sinful uses, our pleasures. Depravity is ultimately a corruption of our, of our desires, our inner desires. Temptation, Satan now is going to be released at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. He's going to tempt the people again. He's going, to, he's going to appeal to their heart. He's going to appeal to their inner desires. That's what he will do. He will lure them. He will entice them. They will follow after him, not just because he's tempted them and won, but temptation always works. If it's working in your life as a pattern right now, it's working because, first and foremost, it's the desire of your heart. You and I, to win the battle over temptation, we need to change the desire of our heart. We need to yield to the work and the power of God, his word, the Holy Spirit, so that he can overcome and transform the desires that we have in our heart, that our desires would be for him and not for and not for ourselves and not for sin. Depravity is all about this. See, when I love me, I won't love him. Depravity is about who I love. When I love myself, I won't love him. When my, I'm the priority, he won't be the priority. Of course we're to love ourselves because we're made in the image of God. But we're not to love ourselves in the sense that we become the idol. We become the priority. We become number one, and God is relegated to number two, three, four, five. We are to love him first and foremost. The problem is I love my sins so much that I reject the standards, the principles, the authority of God's word. That's what happened. Even when he's present. Here he's been here a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. He's been present, um, and yet and, and it, there's been, well, we're going to see that. And yet there's a rejection of that. We see that our environment, our environment can't change what the heart is all about. 
It can't change us. Nothing external in our life can change our hearts. God uses people in our life. He uses circumstances in our life. Those are external, but they ultimately can't change us. I have to make, you have to make the choice in your heart. If God is using a person, if God is using the word, if God is using preaching, if God is using people in your life to change you, it's because you and I have accepted that truth and we are, we are conforming to that truth. The Spirit of God is doing a work in our life. He's using the Word of God and He's changing us. It comes first because He touches our heart. He may use a person to do that. He may use an experience to do that if He's touching our heart. In the tribulation, we see the depravity of man. Terrible judgment. The judgment of God is everywhere. Gospel preaching like never before. Revivals. There's, yet there's a hatred for God. There's a hatred for His people. The martyrs are being slaughtered. And there is a refusal of God's people to repent. That is because of the depraved nature of sin. In the millennial kingdom, we still see depravity. It still exists. It is a time of righteousness. It's a time of peace. It's a time of prosperity. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. He is a perfect ruler. And yet, what do we find here at the end of the tribulation? Sinners will rebel against Christ. <laughs> against all this. Against a perfect environment. It is an amazing thing. The power of the sin nature that lives in your heart and lives in mine. I need to remind you, never underestimate the ability of your own heart, even if you're walking with Christ right now. Even if Christ is your your priority and you love Him right now and, and you're faithful to Him, never underestimate the ability of sin to rise up and to win a victory. We must constantly, day in and day out, yield to Christ and to His Word, to the Spirit of God, so that we might have victory and continue on that path of being overcomers. The second thing that we see in this passage is that Satan is permitted. We've seen that. Verses 8 and 9. He's released to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number, the people that are gathered, are like the sand of the sea. They march up over the broad plain of the earth, and they surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city. We're going to, we see Gog and Magog. We're going to talk about that in just a second. They're like the sand of the sea. Not literally that many, but, but they're innumerable. There's going to be so many that come and gather. Where do they come? They come to the capital of the world as it's known. It's Jerusalem. It's where, it's where Christ lives. They gather. They surround the saints who are living there. Not all believers are going to be living there in Jerusalem. They're going to be spread out throughout the whole world. But many have made a choice. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go live. I'm going to go be where Christ is. And so there's an encampment of saints there. The armies are gathered. Who knows what they're doing as they're coming? Are they killing on their way? Who knows what they're doing? doesn't tell us. And they gather together. And they surround the holy city. And so Satan, Satan is madder than he's ever been. After a thousand years, think about it, he hasn't changed. He's been punished. He's, he's been in the abyss, the bottomless pit. He hasn't changed to look. He's gotten worse. He's gotten more wicked. He's had more time to think about what he's going to do. His hostility towards God, it hasn't changed. And his wickedness, his nature, his character is fixed for all eternity. It's not changing. And he comes out of the abyss. He comes out from being released. And he's, and he's, he's more hostile towards, towards Christ than he's ever been. And his goal is to overthrow Christ. That's what his goal is. His goal is to kill Jesus Christ. He tried that at the beginning when Jesus Christ came. He killed him at the cross, but he didn't win that victory. Now he's, now he's trying again to kill Jesus Christ, to slaughter the saints, to establish his own kingdom. That's his goal. The amazing thing is that there are so many who will follow him, who have, who have hid a lack of genuine faith from all the others, except Jesus knows. And they have played the game, and they have come to Jerusalem, and they have honored the festivals, and they have given offering, and they have, and they have gone to church, as it were, and they've done all the right things. And yet in their hearts, their hearts were never changed. Their hearts were never in relationship to Jesus Christ. How many is that true of today that are in our churches, in, in my church, in your church, around the country? How many is that true of today? We're being touched by the ministry of grace, the Word of God, and yet live in the game. And that's exactly what's happening here. So what does he do? He comes out to do what? To arouse hostility. Hostility against God. Leviticus 6, we're reminding that it is a hostility to, hostility to obedience. 
If you walk in hostility against me, you're not going to obey me. You're not willing to obey me. They have obeyed externally, but not in their heart. Like the teacher says to the kids, sit down. And he sits down, but he says, thanks to himself, but I'm standing inside. That's exactly the reality. They have done on the external level everything that's been asked of them, but on the internal level, there's never been change. The depraved nature, the sin nature is there. They have loved sin all the way through. There's a hostility to, to his words. See, Satan is arousing this hostility against God. The mind that is set on the flesh, depraved nature or love for sin, is hostile to God. It does not to submit to God's law. That's what Satan is after. He is arousing that hostility against God. He is arousing a hostility against God's values. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility? It's enmity with God. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And it all along... These in the millennial kingdom have ultimately been a friend of and hostile to, in their hearts, to God. Satan is arousing that, and he will deceive them into thinking he has the plan now to give them what they've always wanted. Ultimately, to be free from the rule of Jesus Christ, this perfect rule, and yet that's not what they want. Hostility to God's authority. You cannot serve two masters. There will be a hostility. There will be a battle, a spiritual battle. You cannot give yourself to one master and to another master. It will be one or the other. You cannot serve God and, here the context is money, it's anything, right? It's a hostility to God's approval. They've wanted God's approval externally so they don't die, but they've not sought the approval of God's heart upon them. They've been not concerned about who they are inwardly. They've just wanted to survive and to live. And so they've done it externally. That's the millennial kingdom. How many believers are guilty of that? For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, Paul says. He says, here's my goal. I want to please Christ. Ultimately, they didn't want to please Jesus Christ. In fact, their goal here is to remove him from leadership. Here we see the reality of Gog and Magog. This is, uh, this is tough. This is tough. This is one of the this is one of the tougher areas, and I think for uh, this is among many of the tough areas in Scripture. In Genesis chapter two, we see Gog or Magog is the second son of Japheth, uh, Japheth uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three the three sons of Noah. So Japheth has his second son is Magog. He becomes he has a what, kingdom. He has he has power. Ezekiel thirty eight. And 39 are two significant chapters in the Old Testament. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. You have a ruler, you have a land, Gog and Magog. Those two chapters speak of a, of a, of a battle that will affect this world. Um, it's the, the Gog and Magog here, I believe, are not the same, but they tie into, they're emblematic of, the, the terms Gog and Magog, I believe, are emblematic of people who are hostile to God. In Genesis th in Ezekiel 38 and 39, you have the description of, of, uh, of a huge world conflict. Armies from the north, which, would, which are, are Russia and surrounding nations, come against Jerusalem from the north. The difference is, here in Revelation, the armies come from the whole world from north south east and west the description of what takes place here in revelation doesn't fit the description of what takes place in ezekiel 38 and 39 but yet the terms can apply because the same hostility against god's people in ezekiel 38 and 39 is the same hostility that is now being brought with finality against god's people once again I believe the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 happened sometime in the tribulation, maybe in the middle of the tribulation. We haven't camped out on that in the book of Revelation because I tell you what, everywhere I think I land, I see pros and cons on where it might be there in the tribulation, some way, shape, or form. It's really hard to nail down exactly where it is because the text just doesn't tell us. It just it doesn't tell us the when. It tells us that it will happen. It doesn't tell us with the specific details that I want to have assurance, when is it going to take place? We have this battle, and they come together, and they surround Jerusalem, Gog and Magog. The world does. Just want you to see that, understand that. The third thing that we see here is this. Satan is absolutely, finally crushed. 
Genesis 13, we see the prophecy of this that is going to take place. When sin took place, God cursed the serpent. And he said this. He said, he, that's Christ, that's the offspring of Eve, is a singular offspring. Christ shall bruise your head. Christ will, will crush you, destroy you. And you, the serpent, you will, destroy, you will bruise his heel, the heel of Christ. That's context. We can go back there. We can show that. We can see that. But the promise here is this. The prophecy here in this, in this text is this. Is that Satan will bruise the Lord's heel. That's at the cross. But it's not a fatal blow. It is in the sense he dies. He, and then he rises again three days later. It's not, it's not, he doesn't kill God. He kills the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. It is a literal death. And yet at the same time, he rises from the dead in power and in victory. It's as though his heel was struck, and yet the Lord crushes the head of Satan. It is a final victory. See, John 16 tells us that Satan was judged at the cross. Judgment was determined. Judgment was declared. Judgment was finalized. It was brought against Satan at the cross. He is defeated at the cross, Hebrews 2. Through death he came that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. When Jesus Christ gave his life, when his heel was bruised, he won the victory against Satan. He won the victory against Satan's greatest power, death and sin. Satan is crushed by a peacemaker. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. The God of peace will become a warrior. He will crush Satan. That's exactly what he does here. 1 John chapter 3, Satan, the devil, has been sinning from the beginning. The reason that the Son of God came in the first place was to destroy the works of the devil. Revelation 9, fire came down from heaven and consumed all of them. They surround the city. There's no battle here. There's no fighting. They surround the city. There is one word from God. The fight is over. There's no battle. Fire came down from heaven and consumed every one of them. And the devil who had deceived them, he, and, and all of his demonic horde with him, just like they were thrown into the abyss, he was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. He was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan, Satan is taken. He was... He was in the bottomless pit. He was in the abyss for five, for a thousand years, chained. Now he is thrown into the lake of fire. He can never escape. He is there forever. And it is a place of absolute torment. That's what we see here. That is Satan's final defeat. The Lord crushes him with finality, with just a word. He calls fire down from heaven. The armies of this world are destroyed, and Satan is taken. He's thrown into the lake of fire. That's the reality. And just like that, it's over. You and I need that encouragement. We need to know that uh, God has promised you and I power to just be overcomers. The very power that's this right here is the power that Jesus says can be true in your life as well. Matthew 25 reminds us it is an eternal defeat. This is an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, his demon horde. They will be thrown into that like a fire, and folks, it's over. It's done. All demonic forces of all time, with Satan as their captain, will be thrown into the lake of fire, and it is done. It is over. There is nothing left. No battle to be fought. No sin to be fought. It was now just to be judged with one more finality. Satan's battle is over. Folks, it's, it's over. We have a choice. We have a choice what we're going to do. As we think about the millennial kingdom and the depravity of man, think about the finality of God's judgment, his certain victory over sin, over Satan, over the devil, we have a choice to make. Who will you and I serve? Because Satan is able to arouse so many millions to hostility against God, they had chosen in their heart long ago that their allegiance was to, to themselves first and to Satan second when he was released. And their allegiance was not to Christ, the people in Joshua were, were challenged. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day who you will serve. God knows your heart. You know your heart. Where's your heart? 
Is it your heart's desire to serve Christ and be His disciple? Is it your heart's desire to follow after Him? Or is it your heart's desire to follow yourself, to be true to yourself, and to be your own man, your own person, your own woman, and, and, and to make that the path for your life? What is the desire of your heart? You must, you must own that first and say, Lord, that's where I'm at. Give me the grace to be your man, your woman, your person. Give me the grace to follow after you. Give me the strength of will to follow after you. God, change my life so that that's my passion. Who do you love? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind? Do you, do you love God like that? Because if I don't love God like that, I'm vulnerable. And every day I'm still vulnerable. Because I don't love God perfectly like that every day. And I need to make a choice every day. Today, I'm going to serve you. Today, this Sunday, I'm going to serve you today. Tomorrow, when I wake up, this Monday, today, I'm going to serve you. God, Lord Jesus, today, I'm going to love you first. Lord, give me the victory over my heart, over the sin nature that still is in me. Give me the power of, of my new nature, of resurrection that's taken place. God, be my identity today. If anyone's in Christ, he's new. He's powerful. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's the, that's the power of Christ. That's what it's all about. That's his promise to us, to give us power, life, trans, transformation. Who's going to be your identity? Who is your strength? Who is, it that's, who is it that is driving your life? Whose will is it that it is your desire to follow? Yours, the world's? or your saviors, Lord Jesus Christ. The millennial kingdom is a reminder to us we need a savior. It's a reminder to us that we must yield to Jesus Christ. It's a reminder to us that we must serve him and love him with our hearts. It's a reminder to us that we have been transformed so that we can win the victory. We can't serve him and love him in our own strength and our own power. We serve him and love him because he's given us the victory. The one who brings defeat to Satan is the one who brings victory to us. That's your Savior. That's my Savior. That's who I love. That's who I want to serve. That's what I desire for you. That's what I pray for you. That that would be your passion, your heart's desire as well. Just want you to, to keep this in front of you. You've been laying this verse across our heart as a church and in our ministries on Wednesday nights. This reality, taste and see, Psalm 34, 8 says, that the Lord is good. I just want you to know the Lord is always good. The Word of God is good. Now, the Gospel is good news. Every time we encounter the Word of God, we are able to step away from it, no matter what its standard is in our life, no matter what God's will is in our life. The child of God is able to always able to look at the Word of God and say, you know what, this is good news in my life. This is good news. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is what I hunger for. When we read the Word of God and we feed on its truth, we take we 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 continually find the strength, the refreshing, beautiful taste of the Word of God to be our very life. We were reminded here a song, taste. Touch the Word of God. Take not just a nibble, take a bite. Have a meal every day. Eat feed, dwell on, depend on, be strengthened in the power of the Word of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge, who runs to, who trusts in Him. That's my prayer for you. If, if that is your passion, then you are a child of God. You have been transformed by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your life. You have repented and confessed and God has brought life into your into your soul. That sin nature is still there, but you now have the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. You have the ability to love Christ, to follow after Him, to yield to Him, to serve Him. That's victory in your life. That's hope. That's joy. That's peace. That's all of those things that God's Word has promised because every day we wake up and say, okay, Lord, I need Your Word. I'm going to feed on Your Word today. And when we do that, we find that it is, it is always good in our soul and our life. It is good for what I need for the day. It is exactly what I need. May your relationship with Christ be thriving because you love Him. You are tasting. You are seeing. You are experiencing the goodness of God. Follow after Him. Pray that God would put this passion over your heart. Thanks for joining with us. Remember that those you minister to, they have a sinful nature just like you and I. 
Draw them towards Christ. Show them Jesus Christ. Show them His Word. Remind them they need a Savior. Remind them as believers that they need the power of the Word of God in their life. Remind them to listen to the Spirit of God as He takes that Word. May that be true in your life. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.